This is the fit. Um, yeah, I guess that's cool. sacrifices for all of you who are our diplomats and are on the, on the government payroll. But we owe you all, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I'm glad to be here with my great, great old friend, both of them, Chris Dodd and John Kerry. We go back a long, long way. And uh, we all, uh, we really, take a look at this, we're really average age 40. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's how we think of ourselves, right guys? <laughs> And, uh, but we've been friends, I mean, close friends. I don't have any closer friends in the Senate. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, with all those years we served together, and then with John, Secretary of State, and, and uh, nobody knows uh, South, Central, and Latin America better than Chris Dodd. And so Chris, he was even a Peace Corps guy down this way. I just want you to know that, uh, you know, uh, Jill went to uh, pay respects to the Virgin of Guadalupe. When our, son, I don't know, this is, I don't mean this to be sad, it's, uh, when our son was, uh, was, was dying of cancer after being exposed to the burn pits in Iraq for years, the Attorney General of the State of Delaware, I went to, my mother believed the only gateway to heaven was through the Blessed Virgin Mary. You think I'm kidding? Catherine Eugenia thinking of Biden. She thought that was the gateway. And I went down to Our Lady of Guadalupe. I still have the rosary. He was wearing it. Yeah. And uh, there's everything about uh, 
this country that is not only beautiful, but it also, uh, you know, when you get here and you take time to absorb the sounds, the sounds, the smells, the, the views, it's really, uh, it's a different place. As John Romero, the new Secretary of State, I, I made a speech over at the State Department saying there's no reason why we ended the day, John ended the day, when we look to uh, what we could do for Mexico, what we could do for Latin America. Mexico's our equal. This hemisphere should be the most democratic, the most powerful, the most economically sustainable hemisphere in the whole world. But we're going through a tough period right now. Going through a tough period all around the world. I won't take the time. I watch my wife cringe when I say this because she'll think I'm going to speak longer. <laughs> but, is that, uh, you know, we are an inflection point in human history right now. For those points that come along every uh, three or four generations, maybe longer, where the things we do today are going to determine what the next four or five decades are going to look like. We saw what happened after World War II. We had that post-war period. It has basically collapsed. The rest of the world is trying to figure out where it is. You see what's happening in Brazil today, what happened in the United States. I remember the first meeting I had with the G7 in, in, in Great Britain after in February, after we got elected. And we went over and I sat down with the five European heads of state, four heads of state and me. And I looked and I said, America's back. Macron looked at me and said, for how long? <laughs> he wasn't trying to be a wise guy. He wondered for how long. And then another, the chancellor looked at me and said, what would you think, Mr. President, if tomorrow you picked up the paper and found out that a mob had broken down the doors of the parliament and stormed down the aisle broken down the door of the House of Commons to try to change an election. What would you think if that happened in a democracy? Beyond comprehension. Beyond comprehension that could happen. All of you are educated people, particularly you diplomats and, and study diplomacy in undergraduate school and graduate school. Did you ever think we'd get here? Well, we are the United States of America. I've never been more optimistic about our prospects. We have an obligation to lead the world. Madeline was right. We are the essential nation. Not being in our chest, the rest of the world looks to us. They look to us to lead, not to tell them what to do, but to be the glue that kind of holds the rest of the democracies together. And you play an incredibly, an incredibly, incredibly consequential role in that. This is not your first assignment for the vast majority of you. You've been throughout the, this, this hemisphere and other parts of the world. And you know how badly we need you. You know how badly we need your judgment. And we're in a situation where we are beginning to build an America that is, has the most consequential economy in the world, and we're coming back. We're not just building America in a place where we're saying that we're gonna build it like it was before. We're the only nation in the world as a student of history that's come back from every crisis, come out of it stronger than we went in. Stronger than we went in. I'll say it again, stronger than when we went into the crisis. And that's where we are today, and I'm determined to build out America from the bottom up and the middle out, because when that happens, the economy does well, the wealthy do very, very well, and everybody else does fine, has a fighting chance. That's what the rest of the world are looking to us for. They're looking to us to help lead the way into the, 20, into the second quarter of the 21st century. And we can do it. I'm absolutely, positively convinced. Just with your help, just since we got started, we've created almost 800,000 manufacturing jobs in less than two years. We've cut the deficit by $1.7 trillion in two years. More than a, I'm not gonna get into all the detail, but the point is there's nothing beyond our capacity. Not a single thing beyond our capacity. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. The fact of the matter is, folks, better remember who we are. We're the United States of America. There's nothing, nothing to There's nothing we've ever set our mind to be that not a country. And our goal is to make this hemisphere the strongest, most democratic hemisphere in the world. There's no reason why that can't be. There's no reason why that can't be. There's a lot of work to do. We're all doing much of it. I got a chance to ride back from the, the, uh, with the, from the, call me on but back from the, his new airport, 
And uh, so we got to talk about, uh, about a number of problems that the North American uh, leaders are going to be speaking about tomorrow, also with, the, with uh, China. And uh, we're going to embark on the next century in our partnership with Mexico. You all are in the driver's seat. Anybody comes in any of the embassies you are, or any of the, any of the uh, embassies, the embassy and or any council that we have, you're the face of America. They look at you, they don't see me, they don't see me, but they see you. You make a difference how we're viewed. You make a difference how we're viewed. And I heard you say that, uh, someone say that in the nation's film, the opinion of America is risen to 70 It's not because of me. It really isn't. It was a very low bar to overcome. It's because, <laughs> it's because, because of you. Because of this guy here. I got to end with a humorous story. We spent a lot of time together, and, uh, and not only uh, with, uh, with the ambassador and me, but with our, with our families together. And uh, we were in uh, Pueblo. Pueblo, if I'm not mistaken, Colorado, used to be the center out there. Pueblo, Colorado, I think has more Medal of Honor winners than any other city in America. I think that's true. And there's an old railroad station that has been refurbished like it was back in the 1870s. And so we're about to go out and literally, uh, and it's beautiful. It was done by, I guess, a benefactor, because I don't know what it was the state here. Anyway, it's beautiful. It was completely re re revamped, and like it was in 1868 or 72, whatever. And we're, he said, now he, no, he's you give me advice, and I love Joe. We're gonna walk out here, look, look out the window there. There are all those people, there's what, there eight, nine, 10,000 people, literally, across the track on the hill, and you're gonna to speak to them. So make sure you're really respectful. They're used to not being treated that way. I said, he's telling me about all this, I'm listening. And I said, uh, he said, but basically, you wouldn't understand. And this beautiful, beautiful new uh, waiting room, that's what you ride on the platform. It's about as wide as the curtain to here and almost this long. And I'm looking out and, I, and I'm saying, yeah, there's nothing on the walls, no in the wallpaper, except about every 10, 12 feet, there's a brass plaque. The brass plaque is about four or five inches and about uh, wide and about, I don't know, 10 inches long. You know what it said on the brass plaque? No Irish allowed. <laughs> I get it. Gene Finnegan's son gets it. The point I'm making is, everyone, everyone's entitled to be treated with dignity. Everyone. My dad used to say, every single person is entitled to be treated with dignity. That's all I ask of you. Treat everyone you encounter on behalf of the United States with dignity, and we'll do just fine. And, uh, Every time I walk out of my <coughs> Grandpa Finnegan's house up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, he yelled, Joey, keep the faith. My grandmother would no Joey, he yelled, no Joey, spread it. Spread the faith, folks. I look forward to seeing y'all, and I'm gonna come down, if I may, and hang out with you guys a little bit next year. Aww.